Welcome to the e-commerce marketing podcast, the highly rated digital marketing podcast that provides weekly digital marketing tips and strategies from some of the world's top digital marketers and e-commerce entrepreneurs that will help you take your digital marketing to the next level. Sit back and enjoy this power packed episode hosted by Arlen Robinson, who is an e-commerce entrepreneur and digital marketing expert with over 20 years of experience. Hey, e-commerce marketing podcast listener. Are you looking to increase traffic and sales to your website? You can do this by launching your own affiliate program. Just visit getosi.com and sign up for a free trial today. That's getosi.com. Now get ready to hear from your e-commerce marketing expert of the week as they drill down to give you details on marketing strategies that can help grow your business. Welcome back to the e-commerce marketing podcast, everyone. My name is Arlen and I am your host. And today we've got a very special guest, Amanda Sherry, who is the director of marketing at Western Computer. Welcome to the podcast, Amanda. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Yes. And thank you for joining me. You know, today we've got an interesting topic. We're going to be talking about the polarizing beliefs in marketing and the power of SEO. Um, you know, we're talking about polarizing. It's it's these different beliefs where it's kind of split, where it's totally even. There's a certain, let's say, 50% of people feel this way about a subject, 50% of people feel that way. So it's like, you know, drawing straws to decide which way you're going to go. So that's kind of what we're going to be talking about. And I'm definitely excited to, to see your take on that and what are some of these different beliefs where people are kind of, um, you know, mixed upon. And then we'll also be talking about SEO, the power of SEO, the future of SEO, mm -hmm. and all of those good things. But before we do get into all of that, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and specifically how you got into what you're doing today? Sure. So I'm a B2B marketer with over 15 years of experience. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm the director of marketing at Western Computer, which is a Microsoft CSP partner, and that's a cloud solution provider. Uh, we implement support and service Microsoft ERP and customer engagement solutions, as well as Power Platform and business intelligence. Okay. Um, so how I got into this, uh, I've always had a passion for creativity and personal experiences, and I've really been intrigued with the way the mind works. Um, so growing up, I originally wanted to study psychology um, in undergrad, but as that became a reality, it also became pretty overwhelming. Uh, and I selected advertising as my major instead to kind of play in that creative side while also still having a little of the psychology behind it. Um, so outside of undergrad, I found an entry level position in marketing um, and I went back to school to pursue my master of science in public communications. And that's where I really fell in love with human communication with each other and how brands communicate with their audience. Um, and I think that there's a lot to be said with brand messaging and how that brand can make us feel, um, even as individuals and also from a B2B aspect. So um, marketing has really allowed me to tap into my creative side. It's allowed me to expand on my interest in communication and user experience, uh, all while tracking data and testing things, figuring out how, how and why it works, um, and using the data to support any future efforts. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, good, <laughs> good stuff. And speaking about testing, actually, we just, uh, the previous episode that was recorded, we talked about that uh, data-driven, uh, test-driven marketing campaigns, because that's really what it's all about. You know, when you're talking about marketing, you really don't know what's going to work until you test it. Um, you analyze the data and then see if you need to pivot one way or the other or just totally cancel it. So there's a variety yes. of things that you can do based on the results that you get. So, yeah, definitely good exactly. stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, thank you for sharing that. Um, so I figure we'll just go ahead and dive right in um, mm -hmm. to the topic. Um, so I wanted to see what are some of the most polarizing beliefs in marketing that you see today and how does this really impact brands strategies and just overall customer engagement? Yeah, so there's there's a couple. A big one that I hear constantly is email marketing is dead. It's <laughs> right. you know with yes. with data compliance, um, there's been a shift away from you know you're allowing people to opt out more, and you don't want people to opt out. You want people to remain opted in and receive your your communication. Um, but why would you want to reach out to someone that has no interest in what you do or your communication. So I actually feel like the data compliance and the option to give people the app unsubscribe more often is actually 
self cleansing your your list and your um, your potential outreach. So I find it to be more effective um, than it previously was. Uh, another one I think of is that, and you know, the B two B space, everything has to be a hundred percent professional and polished, mm -hmm. and people want to connect with other humans. Companies should be personable and people buy from people. We hear that very often is that they've selected us because we were more personable, we were more down to earth, or we just had overall expertise that we were willing to share. And that comes back to if we were polished with every 100% polished with everything that we did, it would take out that personable touch, uh, which I think is much needed today. Mm. But SEO related, I think there's a lot of polarizing uh, beliefs. I think a big one is that SEM and SEO should be siloed, where I feel they very much need to work together. Um, I've learned from previous experience here. Uh, early in my career, I blindly listened to a company and a SEO partner that wanted me to silo everything. And it was a huge lift in terms of content and forms and tracking and it did nothing for us. Oh, wow. So it it was a huge lesson learned. And now I'm working with a company that fully believes that they should be brought together and that they both benefit each other, which is also what I believe and kind of what the SEO universe is showing that why mm -hmm. would you have things siloed? You know, everything should be working together, especially yeah. in such a digital age. Um, also an, uh, SEO related is that content should be written for seo there's mm -hmm. you know you talk to different people and it's like well no all of your content should be seo first and then written around that and i really think content comes down to aligning with your business goals you mm -hmm. should understand what your business goals are and you should create content that supports that business goal and optimize it for seo um seo can uncover gaps that you can create content for but that ultimately that content in every direction should be back, should be backing all of your business goals and where you want to, um, who you want to target and how you want to grow your business. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. For sure. I'll, I'll go back to the first one that you mentioned, which is email is dead because <laughs> that's one that it, it, every few years it, it comes up. And I've had this conversation mm -hmm. before with some of the experts that have been on the podcast that have talked about email marketing mm -hmm. and, Everybody that I've talked about this, that whole chatter about email is dead. And every time I bring it up, everyone kind of tends to say, at least on our end of this thing, you know, I guess we're, we're on one side of the fence where we're on the, we're marketers and we see the power of it. And like you said, you see how it's a, it gives you the ability to, you know, clean your list and to, to find the right people that are in the funnel. And so, you know, we can go on and on about the powers of it. And so I think you and I and people kind of in our community see the power of it. And it hasn't gone anywhere. But on the other side of it, where it's kind of polarized is where people are saying, oh, OK, you know, I don't really check my email. These are consumers, possibly. And they're mm -hmm. saying, OK, I don't really check my emails that much. It's all about text messaging. The best way to reach me is via text. Um, you know, it's much more efficient. I can quickly respond. I'm not going through all of my emails. I get a ton of junk email anyway. And so that's the other side of it. And, you know, there's definitely something to say about that, um, you know, with the rise of SMS and uh, that type of uh, text messaging communications. Yeah, it, it definitely is efficient for some things. You can reach people immediately, you get immediate response. You can do a lot of uh, kind of flash promotions, flash sales, where, you know, these days, you know, the, at least within the U.S., I don't know what the percentage of people that have smartphones are, but it's it's up there, you know, and people that do have smartphones typically can take it with them everywhere, whether it's, uh, you know, in bed, whether it's a, into the bathroom, you name it, wherever they're going they're they've got that right there with them. So it, it gives the immediate access. So I understand that argument, but I think with email, it's something where you you can communicate a lot more and more effectively as opposed to other forms of communications like the SMS and, you know, the standard written communication. And so it's uh, I think it's, it's here to stay. Um, and so I, I can definitely see um, um, that that argument. And I have a question about one of the things that you mentioned, which is the, the polarizing mm -hmm. fact of the glossy corporate uh, messaging versus mm -hmm the more natural speaking messaging. Mm -hmm. Cause I think it's, 
I'm, I'm kind of um, on both sides of this because as a marketer, I understand that these days, all types of, you know, the big thing these days is the user generated content being more relatable to the end customer, so that, you know, you, you come off being, you know, almost like a friend, but at the same time on my end, when I'm sometimes when I'm trying to look for something, I'm trying to buy something. If I see something that's too, I guess you could say too plain, too simple, too, you know, friend next door, I get a little leery sometimes. What, what's your thought on that? Mm -hmm. I definitely think you have to find the balance with what works for you, depending upon what your company and your brand is. I think mm -hmm. in the B2B space, being too polished, it comes, it, it kind of can sway people against you because they're, you're taking away that relatability with them. Mm -hmm. um, of course, a website overall branding should be professional, but when it really comes down to every brand, it's the people behind that brand, at least within my B2B space. Yeah. So my company is very backed by a group. I mean, we are a group of amazing professionals that have a ton of personality and that are honest and trustworthy. Once you have one conversation with them, you can relate to them. And for us, that's what helps differentiate ourselves from those within the other Microsoft channel and the Microsoft space is we have that relatability. We have that, we have a professionalism, but we also have, we also are very personable. So I wouldn't take away all professionalism, but I would say that in order to be entertaining and engaging and trustworthy, you have to show a bit, a bit of who you are because yeah. people buy from people that they trust. Yeah. Hey there, fellow entrepreneurs and B2B marketers. Before we dive back into the conversation, let me introduce you to a game changer in the lead generation arena, Lead Feeder. Now, we all know the struggle of identifying those elusive website visitors and turning them into valuable leads. But what if I told you there's a tool that not only promises, but delivers on supercharging your lead generation and sales efforts? Enter Lead Feeder. Imagine having the power to identify companies visiting your website track their behavior in real time, and seamlessly integrate it all with your CRM. Lead Feeder is not just a tool, it's your secret weapon for efficient and targeted lead engagement. What sets Lead Feeder apart? It's the ability to provide detailed insights into customer behavior, helping your sales team prioritize efforts and close deals faster. With customizable notifications, lead scoring, and GDPR compliance, Lead Feeder is changing the game. Ready to revolutionize your approach to leads and deals? Head over to leadfeeder.com for your free demo today. That's L-E-A-D-F-E-E-D-E-R.com. Don't miss out on the future of successful lead generation with Lead Feeder. Yeah, very true, very true. So it's really... It's really just all about striking that that right balance. Mm -hmm. you, you don't want yeah. to, in your case, you guys are you know a little bit more relatable than some of your other competitors. Um, you can attract more people that are looking for you know more of a you know a partner that they can count on. That's something that you know they can easily deal with, where they're not just talking to some huge corporate entity where you know they can't reach anybody. Mm -hmm. There's no there's mm -hmm. no face on the other side of that. So yeah, I think it's mm -hmm. you're right. It's it's just about that right balance. You don't want to go too far over because like exactly. you said, in my case, there's certain cases where, you know, when I'm looking for things, if you're too far over, you may lose someone like me that's like, all right, kind of leery about what's on the other end. Do they have a the, you know a good enough infrastructure to be able to you know meet my needs? And if it's too, you know, kind of mom and pop, so to speak, then I may you know, I may bail and look for the other companies. So yeah, it's, it's just about mm -hmm. that, that right balance. Mm -hmm. Especially, I'm sorry, especially with video marketing, with, right. especially with video marketing. Um, I think that's a big one because if you come across too scripted, too polished, then you're kind of robotic and then mm -hmm. everything kind of has, is, is very sharp edge where people are not that. And that mm -hmm. goes back to, again, that entertaining factor. Yes, exactly. And I'm seeing that more and more with these bigger brands and looking at different social media platforms like the Instagram. I'll see these Instagram reels. Um, I recently came across one Instagram reel. It was a, a fairly big company. It's a company that makes uh, 
solid form of cologne for men where it's like a um it's almost like a wax that you kind of it comes in a little tin and you wipe it on yourself instead of the spray Mm -hmm. which uh, Mm -hmm. i guess dissipates more you know quickly than this type of solid cologne but anyway they had an instagram reel where it was just i don't know who the, the person was i don't know if he was an influencer but it was just like you know just a gentleman talking about the power of it he wasn't in some glossy studio or anything like that it was just like he was in his his house and he mm-hmm. was talking about the benefits of it they kind of flew in there the the text and i'm like oh, okay that's interesting and then when i did a little bit of research on it i'm like okay this is you know fairly large company but they decided to kind of go that route you know rather than create like a super glossy video just do a 30 second little uh instagram reel of uh you know a person that was talking about the benefits of it it, it could have been you know, maybe one of their customers or somebody that was kind of coming off to be one of their customers. So I, I, I definitely understand and I kind of see the trends of where things are going with it. And um, I see the power of of trying of being more relatable, even if you're a large corporate um, entity. Now, uh, uh, shifting gears a little bit um, into the SEO world, as we've seen, SEO has really just evolved over the years. It's always changing. And so from your perspective what would you say are the most significant changes in seo practices and how do marketers need to what do marketers need to do to kind of stay adapt of these changes and then the and then the coming changes mm-hmm. so i would the most impactful well there's a couple i should say but a huge one is more of intent based search results as opposed to an intent based content that is not keyword stuffed you know, back very early in the career, when my career, when you were creating content, it was this keyword had to appear on the page five times. And there was this version of the keyword that should also appear. And it just, it, it didn't read for a human. It read for bots and mm. really search becoming intent based and writing for people, I think is again, people buy from people. So I think that is a a huge shift that I've I've loved to see over the years. Um, another one is the importance of video marketing because that that entertainment factor and you know with YouTube that's a huge search engine and having suggested videos in there has been great. Um, I think more people are implementing some type of video strategy than they could maybe give themselves credit for or that they fully know. Um, like on-demand webinars is a really great use case. Someone might say that they're not doing having a video strategy, but they have webinars and that's just longer form video content. Um, So the importance of video marketing, uh, I really like as well. Um, And then, you know, in December of of 2022, Google's update changed to include just from EAT to EEAT. um, And that's experience, expertise, um, author- uh, excuse me, authoritativeness and trustworthiness. And mm-hmm. I think that adding that E with that experience has been coinciding with the intent based results. Um, so I've liked, I've kind of liked all of those directions and how they are pulling together. Um, mm-hmm. and with the shift in SEO. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, speaking of that shift that Google made and you added, um, you mentioned that they added the experience part of it to it. Mm -hmm. I just wonder if doing that is with that experience part of it, is, is that going to benefit more of the larger, more established corporate brands because they have a longer track record, they've been in business a lot longer, as opposed to some of the newer startups, uh, mom and pop shops. Um, what, What do you think about that? Well, I think this comes down to finding your no, understanding your audience, finding where they are and meeting them where they are. Okay. So if you are a, a startup and you sell that, not, maybe piggybacking off of your example of the perfume, if you're a startup there, where mm-hmm. could you find your audience that would sell to that? You know, mm-hmm. I actually had a perfume that was like that and it was fantastic for travel. So right. how can you use TikTok or Instagram and use these hashtags that people are looking at with this algorithm, use kind of that SEO and that backing to help drive your awareness, which is going to result in sales. Um, I don't think that the experience is fully taking away. I think it's just providing addi- additional transparency. Um, like one of the things they recommend is, is attributing your content to a specific author saying who that author is what who how what 
how that author is a subject matter expert for the piece of content that is written, providing that transparency and kind of, you know, the about us page of a company website. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think that's just helps uncover a little bit and startups, I think are more willing to kind of share who they are or Mm -hmm. what drives them or what motivates them than sometimes the larger companies. So I, I would be, I would be willing to say that it's probably helping them if they're using it in the right way, but mm-hmm. I would love the data to kind of back my theory. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. I would love to see that as well. In the whole world of SEO, it's a broad subject. As you mentioned, there's a mm-hmm. lot kind of under SEO. You mentioned the silos of SEO and SEM and how should you, you know, put it all under one or should they be separate? So, you know, it's kind of a lot to it. Um, so with all of this, you know, there's always been a lot of misconceptions about SEO in the marketing world. Could you shed maybe some light on a couple of these myths or misconceptions and, you know, explain really the reality behind an effective SEO strategy? So for me and the ones that I've heard is, are that um, organic searches don't convert or that they aren't qualified conversions. Um, my data and what I'm seeing shows the opposite. So our, I have a custom marketing measurement report that pulls in data from several different sources and allows me to understand how long it took from someone's first anonymous touch on our site to when they converted and hit CRM, when they became an opportunity, our average cost per lead across all of our marketing efforts. And it's uncovered. I knew that SEO was always working. I didn't realize it was one of our top drivers. So mm-hmm. for anonymous traffic and for when people convert in both instances, it is our top performing initiative. Wow. Um, it does take time to get there. Right. So I will just have that as a little um, uh, disclaimer that, you know, sometimes people start with SEM because it's going to get results a bit quicker, but they should absolutely continue to have SEO as the, as the, the back or well, the driver. And then once you have ample time, it's really going to be the leader. And I'm seeing that on my side with my metrics. Yeah. Um, another misconception I hear is that SEO is kind of, you know, like you, you make the updates and it's like, set it and forget it. Right. Like mm-hmm. I added my metadata. I mm-hmm. added my meta title. I have my keywords on the page. I'm done forever. Mm-hmm. And that's not true. Google is making updates on a regular basis. Um, you really need to kind of stay up to date with them, either you yourself or working with an SEO company that helps drive those changes. Um, we do on our side, we do regular technical audits that uncover if a broken link happens somewhere. Uh, it, it may be a backlink. It might not even be on your site. You may be backlinking somewhere uh, or linking somewhere and it that's broken. Or um, it may be that an alt image has changed or is now broken. Um, it could be, we recently went through a huge update to shorten our meta titles and our meta descriptions because those character counts changed. Um, so it's not at all set it and forget it. It's something that you have to continuously work towards. Um, and having an SEO partner that's super knowledgeable is, is really a great way to go. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree. I, and unfortunately, I mean, it's kind of fortunately and unfortunately, you mentioned having an SEO partner is these days is is becoming actually more and more important because of all of that's involved um, and being able to make these changes and being aware of these changes. You mentioned a couple of things like the character count, um, those things changing, um, you know, there's a lot of things that are always changing and, and kind of, let's say, let's say playing devil's advocate. Let's say I'm a, a smaller e-commerce company, smaller e-commerce brand. And I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying about your success with organic search and going the SEO route and it's being successful for you. But let's say I'm a, a smaller brand and I'm like, yeah, you know, I've got some other uh, friends that have brands and they were focusing on SEO. And then last year there was a huge, there was a big update, dropped all of their top keywords down to like second and third pages of the results and, you know, kind of wiped them out They're you know, they're getting, you know, a very small fraction of the sales that they used to get. And, you know, this is, you know, uh, true stories that this has happened to a lot of brands and they're struggling to try to recover because of this. So what do you say to the fact that, you know, nobody knows when these changes are going to come, what these changes are going to be about, how they're going to affect a brand. 
and brands just saying, you know, I'm like, forget about all that. I'll just deal with the, 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 the SEM, you know, I'll just do the paid marketing and focus on that. Don't even worry about it. What's your, what's your take on, on that argument? My, my take would be that they have to focus on creating a website and creating content that is for a human. It's Google is moving away from bots more and more about the keywords and it's really going towards that, that search intent. Um, there was actually a, a, a story that I heard when I was at a marketing conference, an SEO marketing conference, um, and one of the speakers who owned an SEO agency was talking about a website that she was working on and how they were number one in the rankings and they had all of these backlinks and everything was great from an SEO perspective. And then Google changed their algorithm and said, we no longer care about your link, about backlinks. And we, we care about how you read for humans and the company completely tanked and they had to spend all of this time and search, search results. They spent all this time redoing it and rewriting things that were human based. And as a, as a company, yes, those SEO items should be in the back of your head, but you really want to be per people based and you want to have content that is written for a human to understand and digest a bot's not going to be the one that's going to buy your product. So I think the more you can get into the, um, the habit of, people first and personality and highlighting your expertise uh, and your experience, it's, it's going to be better because all of LinkedIn's changes are slowly chipping away and going in that direction. So if you're yeah. already there, it's probably going to help you with one of their results yeah. or one of their yeah. updates. That's, that's very true. And I, I've heard that before. It's as long as yeah, your, your content is more, people oriented or educational oriented and just focused on providing that in customer or that, that person that's searching for your company or, or your content, provide them with that, you know, that information that's really going to answer their questions is backed by uh, either research or different sources or mm -hmm. information about your product line or service line, all of that. Then that's mm -hmm. um yeah, it seems like you can, you almost can't go wrong going that route. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know, of course, there's 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 always caveats to that, and nobody knows what the future of Google is gonna, where the future of Google and some of these other search engines are going as far as how they rank different companies. But you know, the way things are now, I think you're 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 totally right about just going that route of it. Amanda, as we get ready to wrap things up. I wanted to see if you can highlight some emerging trends in SEO and digital marketing overall that you believe is going to shape the future of how companies market their products and services, you know, especially in the fact with the, the fact that there's always these polarizing approaches to going different directions. Yeah. Um, so a couple of trends I'm seeing um, search um, SERP snippets um, mm -hmm. are actually going to be are actually being pulled from the website and not always the metadata. So as much as you want to tell Google or um, other browsers, hey, this is what you should serve, it's it's really re reading your content and trying to figure out that intent of what the what that searcher wants to see um, and populating based upon that. Um, a really great example is, you know, think prior to 2020 when someone were to search mask, do we think that like the 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 COVID masks would were, were, were to come up, like and right. all during it, intent shifted, and Google is yes. trying to predict what someone wants from those results. Um, so I think just having content that goes along with that E E A T is going to be helpful there, and um, that metadata and those meta titles are really the technical back end of it all, um, mm -hmm. but they're not always going to be populated. And whew, AI, if that is ever the emerging trend, yeah. AI is <laughs> everywhere. And yeah. now you're seeing that, you know, Google wants to keep people on Google's page. You know, mm -hmm. they're from an e-commerce standpoint, they're trying to sell directly from, from Google. So, you know, and AI driven SERPs are almost always at the, they're, they are always at the top of the page, but they're almost included in every search that I've conducted recently. So yeah. um, it's just showing, I guess, having enough content on your site to show who you are and then understand that AI is going to be a factor in search results. Yeah. Um, but I think 
also that that goes back to knowing where your audience is and meeting them where they are and have specific targeting, um, mm-hmm. whether they're on LinkedIn or whether they're on Instagram or whether they're on TikTok or, you know, whatever it may be, um, thinking beyond just website SEO um, and trying to expand your your touch points. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, those are some great points. And then, like you said, with AI, it's it's everywhere mm-hmm. and it's just exploded mm-hmm. over the past couple of years. What do you think of, because I mean, we see the ship shifting so quickly and what's your take on the possibility of Google, the way we know it right now, kind of fully shifting to more of the chat style where you know, this is, which is kind of how right now we act, we interact with these AI bots, the chat GPTs, um, the Bing chat, you know, all of those components where you're, it's like you're talking to a person or you're talking to an expert and then they're giving you a specific response, not just a set of results. Do you see Google the way we know it um, with just uh, spitting back the set of results? Do you see that ever going away? Um, and if so, do, do, would you anticipate any type of time frame? Do you think that would happen? I don't see it completely going away because Google still needs to make their money with ads. True, true. So I, there is going to be a shift and there's going to be an evolution. And of course, it's going to depend on what others out there are doing and how that's going to affect Google um, and what they, what they do and they change. But I, I don't see it fully going away right now. I wonder if I'm going to listen back to this in five years. I'm like, what were you thinking? Um, <laughs> I think it's going to be a shift, but I don't see it fully going away because Google does have to make money and yeah, and yeah very paid true. ads are a huge driver there. That is, that's, that's very true. I just wonder, and I'm, I'm just kind of thinking on the fly here. Um, I could see them just because you write ads is, is how they monetize so much of what they do. And I don't, so I, like you said, I don't know, I think it's going to be going away entirely too mm-hmm. soon, but I do think then they're probably already working on this. How do they, um, integrate the ad model into the whole chat mm-hmm. um, AI types of responses. Um, I'm sure there's a way they could do it um, where, you know, you get a response via the chat, but then maybe a, a portion of that is, uh, you know, is some type of ad. Um, I don't know. I'm sure they're working on it and I'm sure that's, they're going to kind of intermingle that at some point, but, um, mm-hmm. but yeah, that's a very valid point. Um, I don't think they're going to, kind of can Google ads too quickly. <laughs> no. um, because, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a huge uh, profit line for them. So um, yeah, I don't, I don't think that's going to happen too soon, but you never know. We'll look back and uh, you know, we can both be amazed, but we'll, we'll, we'll just have to wait and see. Exactly. <laughs> well, Amanda, this has been an awesome conversation. We definitely have loved having you on. I know I've learned a lot and hopefully our listeners and viewers have as well. You know, before we let you go, I always like to switch gears just so our audience can get to know you a little bit better. If you don't mind sharing one closing fun fact about yourself that you think we'd be interested to know. Um, sure. So I think I think it's fun um, that I am ambidextrous to a certain degree. Um, okay. I use both hands equally well in terms of throwing a ball or batting, bowling, carrying okay. items. Um, but when it comes to writing in print and cursive, I'm left-hand dominant, Um, but right-hand dominant with scissors. I can't cut with my left hand. It's very strange. Mm -hmm. Um, My husband is also a lefty, Um, two June babies, both lefties. So it's interesting. Um, But I think that that's really helped me in my career because I get to use both the left part of the brain. That's the analytical numbers fact-based and then the right part, that's the kind of the creativity and emotional drivers. So it's, mm. it's helped me in my career. So I think fun fact, that's also um, a bit career driven or a career based as well. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. Thank you for sharing <laughs> that. Um, I don't know if, you know, I've, I've, I've talked to other people that said they're ambidextrous with certain things. Um, I think like with me, there's certain things where like, if I remember one of my, my school days, I was, mm-hmm. I played baseball, I would bat lefty, even though I'm right-handed. So small things like mm-hmm. that. But in your mm-hmm. case, it seems like you can do a lot of things, both sides. And then even like you said, the analytical and emotional, and that's the, the kind of one of the main things that I'm sure has, uh, you know, helped your career. And I, I see it all mm-hmm. the time because of my background is computer engineering. And a lot of times, when I was, you know, in college, you know, you can clearly see it, your classmates, the engineering, the mathematics, the science, 
um, their social skills were most of the time were lacking. And so a lot of times, <laughs> you know, to be able to have a mix of both is, is really kind of the best of both worlds. So that's, uh, that's good mm -hmm. to know. That's definitely, um, I guess you could say kind of a superpower, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a superpower in fourth grade when our whole class was um, punished and our assignment was to write the entire science chapter. Okay. So I would just start with one hand and then my hand would get tired. I'd write with the other hand and then just keep switching oh, wow. back. So I was the first one done. <laughs> okay. Well, that's awesome. <laughs> Very interesting. Well, thank you for sharing that, Amanda. Um, we appreciate that. Uh, lastly, before we do let you go, if our listeners and viewers want to reach out to you and pick your brain anymore about uh, these polarizing marketing strategies or SEO or anything under that sun, uh, what's the best way for them to reach you? I would encourage anyone to reach out on LinkedIn. Um, it's Amanda Sherry, and um, my headline is the Director of Marketing at Western Computer. Uh, I'm on there all the time. And when I'm not on there, I get notifications on my phone, probably like the majority of us do. Um, so yeah, so feel free to reach out. I'd love to continue the conversation and talk analytics and SEO back. It's my, uh, my wheelhouse. I like it. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing that. We'll definitely um, have uh, the uh, link to your company's website, of course, in the show notes and uh, your LinkedIn handle as well. So people can contact you that way. All right, Amanda, it's definitely been a pleasure once again. We really appreciate having you on the e-commerce marketing podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the e-commerce marketing podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and share it with everyone you know. Are you looking to take your digital marketing to the next level, but are tired of weeding through countless YouTube videos with unproven and untrusted marketing strategies? Well, we have the answer for you the More Sales Every Month online digital marketing course. In this information-packed course, you will learn effective keyword research, link building, content marketing, and much more to attract and convert your site visitors into paying customers. Just go to moresaleseverymonth.com and sign up today for a low one-time fee. In addition to this power-packed course, if you would like to get access to a growing repository of digital marketing articles, PDFs, and eBooks, check out getosi.com resources and opt in to get full access to our library of priceless marketing information to help you take your digital marketing to the next level.